Good morning. How are you? My name is Tim Shigel. I'm the founder of a company called Share This, which we created here in Cincinnati. Uh, go start up Cincinnati. If any, any startups out there? Uh, so I created Share This a number of years ago uh, because I was given an insight that with the explosion of information online, we were going to become more dependent on things people share with us to find new information. And it turns out that was pretty true. And the company has grown tremendously. Headquarters is now out in Silicon Valley, where I've been most of this week. And um, we reach now, we're on 5 million websites all over the world in multiple languages. And actually, it's seen and used by nearly 700 million people every month. Odds are some of you have probably shared already this morning, right? So uh, that's terrific. But along the way, and I'm very grateful for it, God's also uh, taught me a number of different lessons. Um, one of the first things that happened a few years ago was uh, it, it hasn't all panned out exactly the way I thought it would. Uh, I um, decided uh, instead of moving to the West Coast to stay here with my family and make sure my kids got to grow up in a, what I thought was a, a better environment and, and, and uh, one that they were used to. So I didn't stay out there. And as a result, I don't run the company every day. And um, so there are things that are still not done that I would have loved to see done. Maybe they'll get done someday. Uh, the original vision was, uh, that I had was really an optimistic one uh, about the internet, which is sharing can help me find more trusted and relevant information, right? But unfortunately, uh, I don't think that's always true today in terms of what's happening. Uh, and we see this um, in a number of different ways. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. And my uh, request for you is to think before you link. It may sound a little odd coming from the share this guy, uh, who, who's benefiting from all the sharing that you're doing. Uh, but I'd like you to think about that. We're creating so much content now, right? And it's great. We, it's all right in our hands. We've got the world's information right here. Matter of fact, by the time I'm done talking, there will be 22 and a half million pieces of content linked to Facebook and 650 hours of YouTube video uploaded to YouTube. It's incredible. Matter of fact, if you look at all information from the start of mankind, 90% of it has happened in the last two years. Right, it's, it's incredible. So uh, while there's a lot of benefits to that, there are also some, um, some downsides. And so it feels like we're, you know, we're in a flood of information while we're starving for wisdom. Right? Anybody feel that way? Well, when the, when the open web first came out, we thought it was going to lead to this great renaissance of new ideas and, and diverse ideas. And in 2008, there was a book that came out by a professor, Thoreau, from the University of Pennsylvania, which um, shared research about the web, which showed that actually ideas were oversimplified and the snowball effect happens into polar opposites of whatever the, the, um, the concept was. So red versus blue, black versus white. Um, I think we have that diagram from his book. That's the actual data research from this linking. So what's happening is ideas are formed into these overly simplified ideas that are, that are polar opposites. This is a problem. It's, it's created more confusion, more division. We feel more lonely and isolated. Uh, sometimes, uh, instead of loving our enemies, we simply unfriend them, right? <laughs> so in 2012, because of Share This, I was asked to go participate and help out with the presidential election, which was a pretty big deal. And I'm not really into politics, but they wanted to help with technology. So it was a great chance for me to learn about how this whole process works. And what I found out was that the division in D.C., some of it comes from the introduction of CNN in 1980. CNN was the first 24-7 news channel, right? There wasn't enough news to do 24-7. So what did they do? They had to go create news. So you go to people, hey, Chuck, Mingo, what do you think about Brian Tome? And they take some, con they take some comment out of context, go back to Brian. Brian, did you know Chuck just said this about you? And this is what happened in D.C. And you see, you've seen it play out in the um, debates. So what happened there is they used to, uh, in D.C., people used to live you know, together in the same, you know, same neighborhoods, people that were on either side of the fence. They'd go to the same restaurants, hang out at the same pubs, play on the same baseball teams. They don't do it anymore because the media pitted them against each other. And I have a concern that, my, that that's going to happen to us, that my kids are going to grow up and you know, creep on somebody's Facebook feed to figure out what neighborhood they're going to want to go live in. 
or what company they were going to go work for. And I just don't think that's going to be a good thing. So I want to talk about three ways where maybe we can help avoid that from happening. And the first one is, maybe, maybe the answer is we just need to share more of the right information. Like if we cut through the noise and get that information out there, people will finally realize the truth, right? So there was this big study, a big expensive study that was done online. Uh, I'm going to share, we're going to, we're going to try to uh, reproduce that study here today. So if you've seen any political opinions posted on Facebook, <laughs> how many have changed your mind based on what somebody posted about politics? It's a big crowd. I do not see a single hand. Okay. <clears throat> if you did reply, do you think you've changed the mind of that person who posted it? No. All right. So the results of the study are in. 100% of the people, nobody's changed their mind, and everybody's just miffed. <laughs> right? This is what happens. There's a uh, professor, Sherry Turkle, from MIT, who actually has a great TED Talk, and she also wrote a book called Alone Together where she talks about some of the hazards of technology and how we depend on that uh, for the illusion of companionship, she calls it. She also has a phrase in there which I love, which is, I share, therefore I am. <laughs> people are sharing because it, it, it gives you a feeling of some self-worth as if you can, you're contributing and people are actually listening. So we're sharing more, but we're still not accomplishing that. We also don't know what we're sharing. So uh, recently, there was a, uh, a website called The Science Post. It's a satirical news site like The Onion. And they decided to do this little experiment. They posted an article, and the text of the article was, was gibberish. It was the Latin lorem ipsum stuff that designers use when they, when they do a post just to fill space. So there was nothing in the article. But the headline said, study, 70% of Facebook users comment on science posts. Guess what happened? 56,000 people shared that and commented on it as if it was a real article. <laughs> Another study validated the same thing. Six out of 10 people share links without reading the articles. So we're creating this echo chamber of bad information. We're creating that snowball effect, and, and we're the ones receiving it. The big media is actually us. All right, so sharing more through the noise, that's kind of hard. Maybe, maybe what we should do is just build better social networks with smart people who could help share their knowledge and wisdom with us. So we go out there, and we have great tools to do that, and we build these great social networks. If you're on Facebook, the average Facebook user has 338 friends. On LinkedIn, it's over 500. But what you need to know about is a number called the Dunbar number. This was created by Professor Robin Dunbar, who is an evolutionary anthropologist, I have to slow down when I say that to get it right, from University of Oxford. And Dunbar studied uh, civilizations from the start of mankind all the way through uh, modern corporations and military structures and found that we, only, that we have a finite capacity with our social capital. There's only so much time we can invest in people, and therefore we can only maintain friendships with 150 people. That's it. There's a limit. And that 150 breaks down in terms of level of intimacy from 100 to 50 to 25 down to five, where five is the group of people that if you're sick in the hospital, those are the five people that would come see you at the hospital. Dunbar believes our Dunbar number is actually potentially going to go down, that these social tools are actually making us less social and therefore limiting the amount of influence we have on our, on our friends and our, uh, and our relatives. So instead of, the Bible calls us to be, you know, salt and light. Salt adds the flavor. We add that positive. We can use technology in a positive way, add flavor to the food, add flavor to the technology and, and the information, and light meaning the truth and pointing to the truth. But instead, I'm afraid we're turning into oil and water. All right, so there's some hazards with the social side. So maybe the answer is we just need better search engines so we can go get the right information, right? So we can get the truth. We want to go find the truth. Well, that's getting harder, too, and the reason is because the business model is actually changing. On July 12th, The Guardian, a newspaper in the UK, actually had an article titled, How Technology Disrupted the Truth. And in it, they say, journalism used to be about building an informed, active public that scrutinizes the powerful, not an ill-informed, reactionary gang that attacks the vulnerable. Publishers no longer can afford journalists. These journalists used to be paid to do the investigation to figure out what was really going on. 
They don't have them anymore. So everybody has their own versions of the facts and are promoting them, and we're all helping them promote it. Matter of fact, publishers you know, learned how to drive television ratings. Now they've learned how to drive clicks and shares. Believe me, I know. We do a lot of that to <laughs> share this. So what you need to understand is that you are the product. All right, maybe that was a little corny and scary early in the morning on a Sunday. <clears throat> and I don't mean to scare you, but I want to make sure people understand how it works. Right? It's important that we understand how it works. The system is not designed to reveal the truth. It's just not. So as I look for the truth and wisdom, what you have to remember is that the source of all wisdom comes from God. Right? And when you get confused and think the world seems complicated, you go back to God's Word. So there are three things from God's Word that I thought I'd share with you. The first one is, is about restraint. So Proverbs 10.19 says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. I'll stop there. <laughs> Second, listen. Proverbs 18.2 Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Ring true? In the tech world, we say never, a bring, never bring your opinion to a data fight. <laughs> and finally, pray. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So again, I'd ask you to think before you link. Three things to think about. One is, what's the purpose of sharing that link? Am I trying to help somebody, or is it just a selfish reason for sharing it? Two, what am I sharing? Is it accurate? Is it truthful? Is it helpful? Did I read it? Second, is there a better way? Do I have to share it? If there's somebody that you know needs help, maybe you should just go spend time with them. Thank you.